Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm just going to take a minute here and let everybody start getting logged in while I get us going on Facebook. Hopefully we can get on Facebook this week. Um, so uh, today, David's going to be talking about something that all of us probably deal with, even me <laughs> on my uh, condo patio, uh, we control. So um, just to give everybody a quick note about uh, how we're going to be doing questions, David and I were just chatting. He's going to be covering weeds in a few different categories, starting with like the tree and shrubby kind of plant type weeds, poison ivies, ivies. Um, some of that kind of thing. Then we'll move on to lawn and garden weeds, and then we'll move on to actual weed prevention. So if you have questions on like lawn and garden weeds, we'll be taking those at you know, kind of in the middle of the class. So we're going to try and segment the questions out that way. Um, so just be aware of that. If you have any questions during the class, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring that. And then whenever David is taking questions, I will give those to him. If you have any issues uh, during the webinar and that aren't questions, uh, I'm gonna open up the chat now. You can send me a chat uh, or send me a Q&A, but <laughs> the chats are good if you're having any kind of tech issue and I'll do my best to help you out. We are recording today. And so we will post the recording on our YouTube channel following the class. If for any reason you need to leave early. Those usually become available the next day around lunchtime. Um, I think that about covers it from me, David. I know we always get a ton of Q&A on the uh, weed-related topics because everybody has their own issues that they're dealing with. So I will go ahead and, and let you get started and dive in. Excellent. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. And as Sally mentioned, we're talking about weeds today. What I really want to do is I want to title this session about how to kill plants. But we just thought, yeah, if we put that out, that may not uh, entice too many people. Uh, but, you know, we spend, uh, we're here every couple of weeks and we're talking about how to nurture our plants, how to, you know, gardening tips, how to make things grow better, keep them prettier, all that kind of thing. But today, um, taking a little bit of a different direction and going to talk to you about how to kill plants. Uh, and that's really because sometimes, you know, the plants themselves can become a problem. The plants are invasive. You know, they're taking over of uh, too much space. They're growing in locations that you don't want it. There's any number of reasons that you may want to actually get rid of a plant. So basically what I'm trying to say is a lot of times I have people coming in and their first question is, well, is this a weed? I'm kind of almost not getting into that issue because I feel like that's really up to you to decide. Uh, I'm defining a weed today as basically a plant that you want to get rid of. Uh, if for some reason, and I can't imagine why, but you had beautiful celosia growing in your garden like this, and it was you know bothersome to you, this celosia up here, and you want to get rid of it, then hey, maybe I call that a weed for some reason. So Essentially, you will decide what's a weed. People come in, they bring plants, samples for me to identify, and I'm always saying, well, it can be called a wildflower, it can be called a weed, uh, it can be called an invasive plant. Um, the title really just depends a lot on how you view it, how you want to look at it. But there are a few things that I can say are common characteristics of what would be called weeds and plants that we definitely want to try to get rid of. Uh, First and foremost, I'm going to say that they're opportunists. Uh, what happens is most of the plants we're talking about today, you will find them in disturbed areas. So if you have uh, an established planting area, let's say it's a, if you're really fortunate, you have a mature undisturbed forest area and you kind of have it in that condition, you don't have a lot of these weeds and invasive plants so much as where they're going to show up is when that area gets disturbed uh, through whether it's construction or you know flooding, that kind of a disruption, soil gets churned up or soil gets exposed. And wherever you have that exposed soil, this is where I'm saying weeds are opportunists, that's where they will move in and show themselves. Uh, weeds are, tend to be very prolific, which means that they can multiply quickly uh, not only do they come in and establish these disturbed areas promptly, but they're either very prolific seed producers 
or they can reproduce vegetatively where they've got runners that uh, send these roots on this system. Sometimes they have tubers, you know, underground storage uh, organisms. But like I said, they're, they, they're opportunists coming into areas quickly, growing aggressively, prolific in their ability to spread and disseminate themselves, whether it's through seeds, rhizomes, runners. Uh, and I also, I like to call them survivors because most of the time what we're calling weeds are basically plants that can adapt to very uh, different conditions and to different extremes that are in there. Uh, I use one Japanese stilt grass, which many of you may be familiar with. It's a, um, it's a grass looks kind of like crabgrass that's in there. It was introduced in this country in the early 1900s accidentally. It came in as shipping material down in the sort of Tennessee area. And when I first saw that, which was more like 35 years ago, we didn't even know what it was. It took a few years even just to get it identified. Now it's like the number weed, number one weed in the state, you know, and it tends to really thrive in moist, shady environments, carpeting the forest floor, but it can also grow out in a hot, sunny environment. So it's prolific. It's a seed producer. It takes in there fast and adapts to different environments and it's able to survive. Just the seeds can survive for seven or more years, just dormant in the soil. So like, that's what I'm talking about. These are, are plants that are annoying, but you can tell I, I focus a lot of my time and attention on, and you can probably even hear my voice. I kind of have this respect for them and their survival strategies and some of the biology as much as they annoy me and drive me crazy. And I, I combat it too. Um, I do got to give it to them, uh, give them a little bit of a high five on, on how they are able to survive and dominate. Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about different chemicals to, to treat it. But before we get started on that, I want to say, first and foremost, I am 100% on board um, saying that anytime you can physically go in and remove the plants, digging them out, um, so I'm saying creating barriers, anything that good cultural practices, uh, dense planting, you know, all these things, anything we can do to discourage weeds before reaching for the herbicides, um, that is 100% comes into play to it. I'm just not, because of time uh, limitations, I'm just not going to be able to spend too much time on that area. But for starters, I do want to say, in terms of prevention, creating a barrier, just keeping that ground covered and occupied can help to prevent weeds from getting in there, preventing that opportunity to get in there. So one of the ways that we tend to do this, this is one of the many purposes when we go mulching our landscape, uh, putting some mulch in the soil helps replenish the soil with organic matter, helps conserve moisture. It can help to discourage weeds that are in there. But we are talking about like one to three inches of mulch. You can absolutely have too much of a good thing. And we hate seeing this. This is what we call the volcano mulch. So when I'm talking about mulch, um, I'm saying moderation in all things. Uh, I think that was Socrates that uh, taught us that or was credited with that quote. And so while I'm supportive of these kind of physical, mechanical strategies, we have to do it right. If you look at this tree, uh, this is all stem tissue. It will continue down into the ground just like a post and it goes straight down into the ground and there's what's called a root collar, a root flare. That is all stem tissue. That should be visible. When it gets buried under a pile of mulch, like you see here, that mulch is holding moisture up against the stem. It's going to lead to a bunch of different problems because as that bark, the moisture is held in there, the bark starts to deteriorate, it starts to get soft, it starts then decay organisms uh, begin to move into there. This layer of bark, it also interferes the ability of air and water to actually get down to where the roots are. So the tree can't get the oxygen that it needs. It starts putting roots up there. We start getting circling roots, insects. Uh, this is just a recipe for disaster. Um, so when I say mulching, hey, I'm, I'm always conservative. I might put in my own garden, I've tried to maintain about one inch layer of mulch. I don't think anybody in the business is saying anything more than three inches of mulch at most. 
and not piled up against the trunk. So we really, um, this is the good intention, but it has really gone awry. Of another thing I'm going to tell you, I am not a fan of these landscape fabrics, these barriers that go into the soil. This is done a lot in commercial landscapes and uh, a lot of people that are just trying to cut down on maintenance. The concept being that, hey, if I um, just over the soil, if I can put this blanket, this fabric down, it's creating a physical barrier to block weeds from being able to grow or get started in there. They are effective in deterring and discouraging the weeds. Nothing's 100%, but they work. My uh, dislike of them is this is a it's a synthetic material as it as it is intended to be. It never degrades. Uh, I've got people that um, work in one customer. They say he put it down 35 years ago. Uh, it's still there. He's in the process of has been removing it from his garden uh, as he encounters it. So it's um, it's synthetic. It stays there. The idea is that it is porous to allow air and water to pass through it. That's what, um, what we're all told. But I am a pretty solid believer that this does create a barrier um, to air and water being able to penetrate in there. Your plants don't get rooted in there as well. You don't get the decomposition of organic matter going into the soil. So you're not replenishing the soil. This is an example, I've used this in some previous uh, classes and presentations, but this was a client who had a um, had landscaped their, their driveway that has circular driveway and around the center of the driveway had formed it in a form of way of these boxwoods. These boxwoods were planted in the center of uh, this island. They didn't really have any effective way of getting water out there. So the concept was, they mixed some water holding polymers down into the ground when they did the installation. They put some landscape fabric on there to try to cut down the maintenance um, and then put the um, boxwoods in a mulch bed. So um, fortunately, they, uh, well, they did some water and get them established. They had some good rainfall. The plants got themselves uh, somewhat established, but then about two, maybe three years into this, uh, we hit a dry spell, we hit a drought. Again, they don't have a good means of watering it. And one by one, you can see what's happening when these plants are drying out at the top. Uh, we really started getting investigating into all this. They have this superficial layer of roots that's growing up above the fa fabric, um, very little root development going on below the fabric. And because of this shallow rooting and the inference of this um, of this uh, weed barrier, uh, their plants are slowly dying and they're just trying to have to deal with that. I don't know if they somehow made a commitment to watering or removing, replacing, but there's no good way out there. So I think these weed barriers in a, in a landscape, like under a dry creek bed, under a patio, under, um, but just not in a garden bed. This is where we're um, putting down a much more sensible, it's a biodegradable mulch in a vegetable garden environment. And so something like straw, which stays loose and aerated and it, it drains well and it degrades quickly. Straw can be used a lot of times that we say in a vegetable garden because we're cultivating that frequently, changing it over. Uh, but putting down like a layer of newspaper, like we've seen here, works really well. Just one thick, that, that newspaper and the straw and everything pretty much degrades within about, uh, definitely in a 12 month period, just turns back into organic matter. Some people use cardboard as a sort of to add that layer. Again, it's biodegradable, it lasts a little bit longer, but these things degrade and break down. So I think that probably has more application in a garden area than say the fabrics do. But what I'm going to talk about right now is going to we'll spend the rest of time talking about how we can get rid of some of these plants from a, and this is going to be the use of herbicides rely on heavily. So I want to um, start out our story a little bit and talk about what do you get, how do you get rid of nuisance trees or weedy trees? And I'm using the Alanthus altissima, the tree of heaven, as our first example. Uh, this tree was, was intentionally brought to this country and planted uh, up in the New York area because it can be quite decorative. It's got this nice, uh, you know, almost palm-like leaf that's on there. This is... Um, 
called compound leaf that's in there that these are little leaflets but all together that's one big leaf that's there they'll actually get kind of an attractive flower some fall coloration to it uh, they're planted because of their durability they grow really fast and they'll grow in almost any conditions one of the problems is though back to what you're saying that's a prolific seed producer so these seeds can blow and scatter and move with the wind um, everyone that seems to work its way into a little crack or crevice takes hold and begins growing and it's like I said a very durable tree so it becomes an invasive species one that was introduced but now it starts to dominate the landscape and becomes a real pest and a real nuisance of uh, we add to that now that it is a the primary host for this what's called the spotted lanternfly of uh, this basically it's not a really cool looking insect but it also again it's it's introduced it came over here accidentally from asia and think of it as like a giant tree hopper uh, is what it is and its mouthpiece which you can almost see right in here its mouthpiece is essentially it's a it's a stylet that pokes into the plant and sucks sap out of it and as, as it's sucking that sap out of the plant it creates this copious amount of this honeydew, this residue that screets out that sticky, sugary kind of material. Um, so not only is it stressing the plants, um, damaging them, creating this huge mess under it. Uh, and like I said, this is an introduced species that's very prolific and widespread. This is one of the nymphs uh, that's out there. This is one of the adults right now today you can find both nymphs and adults out there where their point where these generations are overlapping so this pest has been spreading out and out and out uh sort of from the pennsylvania area and the usda and and cooperating agencies we've been working very much to try to create quarantines to try to prevent this spread because this is um can be a very significant agricultural pest you know gets bothers fruit trees grapes um you know and uh, and several different ornamental plants so where I'm, I'm trying to do a lot in here quickly here is um one of the efforts that we've had is to try to prevent it from gaining entry into fairfax county is we've been working to eradicate these trees so in Prince William County, Prince William is under a quarantine. We have already gone in there, eliminated these trees. Last year, because we know this is insective spreading, we started last year in eliminating these trees. And we are now, because they're now, August, September is their mating time. This is when they're out and about. Um, and we've been making renewed effort to go around. And our goal is to destroy this tree of heaven because it's an invasive tree it's spreading it's uh disrupting our natural ecology and it is the primary host and attractant to the spotted lanternfly so by eradicating this tree of uh, we will hopefully do something to slow down the spread of that lanternfly now with alanthus if i just cut it down i will cut it down and it's prolific at suckering and re-sprouting and coming back up so cutting down it is is kind of a, a futile effort it only it multiplies it, it produces more suckers trying to dig that tree out is a beast of a task um, it can be done but it has this very aggressive spreading root system so when we are digging it out it's a it's a, a real undertaking a huge task and we're causing more disturbance in the soil and then that usually comes back and shows up where then we start having more invasive plants what is going to give us our really best effort on that is using an herbicide so this right here i'm trying to show you calling it a brush and stump killer that you can see here the active ingredient here is an herbicide it's called triclopyr triclopyr has been around since the the late 70s or 80s it's not anything new but it works really well on getting rid of these plants so the most effective way um, and this is a, a bush honeysuckle I'm using to demonstrate with. And I've, I've been using this product, working with it for years on a lot of different plants. It works quite well for us, is what I call a scratch and squirt method. So if I have uh, things like this bush honeysuckle or the 
tree of heaven or lanthus, the most effective way to treat it, right? Just I'm going to just wound that branch. So I'm going to scratch a little bit. And it's a little bigger than that because I want you to see right under the bark, right? This is where that cambium layer is. That's the growing tissue. That's the live tissue on a plant where all the water and nutrients move up and down the stem. And I can take this and it has a little paintbrush and I will paint that. I will put that right into this wound. And it ensures that the herbicide gets into the vascular tissue of the plant. It translocates up and down. So we'll move down into the root system and kill the plant completely. Of uh, it normally takes about three weeks to do this. I have used this on things like Atlantis and Eliagnus and Japanese honeysuckle, poison ivy, any number of plants. And while we can never guarantee outcomes, I've had really good success. Eventually, you know, those plants, some of them, the bigger, the more mature they are, it, you may end up having to come back and do some repeat treatments. Uh, some plants are really, really difficult to deal with. They might send a, some back up by suckers and re-sprout, and you may have to come back and do again. But to me, that's really our most effective method on getting rid of these uh, trees. So this, basically the same method would apply to, in this case, I'm talking about Eliagnus or the autumn olive. Uh, again, I look back, I was, Back in my junior year of uh, high school, I was working with the Forest Service um, and we were out planting these. We were planting and restoring areas that had been logged as wildlife habitat because we had this vigorous shrub that would um, grow under almost any circumstances, produces this beautiful fragrant flower, you know, these nice pretty berries. And we were planting them uh, to restore areas because for good wildlife habitat. We just didn't have the knowledge back then that we do now. This is a prolific, prolific plant. Again, you can see all these beautiful berries. The birds eat them, they disseminate them, and then this tr plant becomes an invasive species. So much like the bush honeysuckle I was just showing you, uh, which is a beautiful plant that was introduced for ornamental values and gets pretty berries and nice flowers and fragrant, and all these nice qualities, but then it just grows everywhere and becomes dominant. So if you run into this, that kind of scratch and squirt treatment, with the um, brush killer works well. Um, now this same thing, and I'm gonna really qualify this on like poison ivy, or if you have honeysuckle or um, wisteria, some vines that are growing up into and strangling trees, this same method works well, but you have to be careful because like me, I'm highly allergic to poison ivy. I, well, I don't even show you, but I have some right now from doing a little weeding in the yard, not paying attention. Um, so this is poison ivy, and if you have any kind of allergies, um, you may want to just, you have to use your own judgment and be super cautious about undertaking this or getting up close and personal with any of it. But this is, there's a lot of um, confusion about identifying poison ivy. Generally three leaflets. This is a young vine, so sometimes the new growth comes out sort of reddish color. It changes dark green as it matures. It has... If you'll notice, this leaf has this little stem, this little petiole that's on there. Oftentimes, that's a nice little identifying characteristic right there if you're uncertain on it. Because something like, um, I'm trying to think, the uh, Virginia creeper would often get mixed as five leaflets and they attach. They don't have that little petiole. So, and I'm going to take some questions here. Uh, so, on these woody plants, uh, like I said, if you can get up close and do your scratch and paint this into the wound dressing, that works well. If you can't, this is the exact same active ingredient that's in the other one. This is also triclopyr. This can be applied as a spray onto the foliage and it's absorbed through the leaf and translocates back into the plant. The biggest difference is if you're doing the spray, you have to be careful that you only target, that you only contact the plant you're trying to kill. Because if you have surrounding flowers and stuff, then you risk collateral damage. All right, let me get a few questions in because I see how quickly our time is going.
Definitely. Um, with David, we've had a couple of questions about the porcelain berry. Can mm -hmm. would that be handled in the same way as the um, tree of heaven and the poison ivy? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The same. That's why I'd recommend the same thing. These are, like I said, these are the same product. One's applied as a spray. One's applied as a paint. So like porcelain berry, it sometimes branches out and covers a large area and has a bunch of stems. You may find the spray is easier to use, but, the, but either one of these would work. You just have to figure out which formulation is best. Okay. So the next question is about um, trees that aren't necessarily... Uh, they're not invasive, but they seed and produce seedlings prolifically. This particular person says they have a silver maple and um, their husband doesn't want to get rid of it, but the seeds in the spring are prolific. They cannot prevent the seedlings. Is that something that you could address now or maybe that would come up later where you have a plant that's Yes. Not not evasive, but a little bit aggressive. <laughs> so I so I remember I was leading up this. I remember a story and I can tell it now because I well, my, but the people involved in this story are now deceased. So I'm, I can share this publicly. I had a husband and wife team had a uh, golden golden rain tree in their front yard. Cubertaria. It gets these beautiful yellow flowers uh, midsummer but produces a lot of seeds and those seeds drop down, those seeds sprout everywhere. So this might be sound familiar. Um, so husband wants to keep the tree because he doesn't want the expense of removing a tree and he likes the flowers. Wife does not want the tree. Um, she's more interested in putting a native tree in its place and she's tired of cleaning up all the little seedlings. So what we ended up doing, um, I, I didn't, really I just you know shared advice I didn't take any act role she started using this and basically painting it onto the bark of the tree and this was a pretty good sized vigorous tree it had about a you know five inch caliber on it um, and she told me it took a few months but after about four applications that tree mysteriously died and her husband was never the wiser so that's that I'm not telling you what to do, but that is a possibility. <laughs> um, David, my mother will swear to this day that it was an accident, that she might have done that with a palm tree to my father when I was a child <laughs> as well. Yeah, we, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, this, not is, everybody. Um, this, this is basically, <laughs> like I said, I can never guarantee outcomes because something like a silver maple, which is an incredibly vigorous tree, um, and depending on the size and everything, it may take some persistence. It may take several applications. I, I can't even, on if it's a really big tree, I'm not sure exactly at what point this becomes ineffective, but that would be my best suggestion. If you're, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah, that reminds me of my mom. She swears it, she swears it was an accident. To this day, none of us are really sure. Um, all right. So, uh, Here's a question for this uh, brush killer stump killer, the fertilum. What's the effect on wildlife? Are there any concerns about using that that people should be aware of? Uh, it does. It is a concern around aquatic environments. Um, okay. so you would read and follow the precautions that are on there, uh, meaning that you want to be really careful it doesn't get in the streams, valleys, or, you know, any kind of waterways, but it degrades rapidly in the soil. Uh, like I said, it's been around since um, at least 1980, even a little bit before that, and it's got a pretty true track record. It's interesting, these things, they're, they're synthetic growth regulators, so plants naturally produce auxins, which are compounds to regulate cell division in their plant. This is a synthetic growth regulator that in a sense overstimulates growth and it messes up the cell division within the plant. And so you start to see distorted, twisted, irregular growth, and then it kind of dies out that way. So it's pretty targeted. Okay, okay. Um, all right, let's see. We have questions about creeping Charlie knotweed, uh, something like a strawberry. Oh, strawberry plant spreading. These might be more so like lawn and garden bed related. Yep. Except thistle. I don't know anything about thistle. So that all fits into kind of my next little group right. of slides. So I want to ready to move on. Move on here. 
uh, because what we were talking about before is just like I said, weed and you know, brush and that kind of thing that that you don't really have a uh, like I said a, a garden type environment. Now, a couple of weeds that you mentioned in there. Uh, this is creeping Charlie or ground ivy. Uh, it's a member of the mint family, and it's really quite attractive. It spreads and creeps on the ground like this. Uh, when it's in bloom, so pretty, and people might even ask, um, hey, where can I get that? Uh, but the thing is with this plant is it just, I'm showing this spreading, trailing kind of growth habit, and it just keeps going. It tends to concentrate in shady environments, uh, though it can grow or sun and shade. Uh, it was brought here by the Europeans, so it's an introduced plant, but I think they, um, it, they even use it some had some culinary use that they put in there and some people even say medicinal use so a lot of different plants like even like um i think you'd mentioned strawberries um definitely to a certain extent violets these are pretty sturdy hard to control weeds of uh, again hand pulling and those kind of things is very very possible of uh, but this is also where we can go after with a um, with a weed killer. What I want to talk about here, though, is what I say this sort of this concept or this idea of selectivity. So let's pretend that you have these weeds growing in your lawn. You've got like creeping charlies growing in your lawn. You can say, I want to kill this weed without killing the grass. Um, and we can certainly do that. And I'm using here as an example. So this is triclopyr. This is the same active ingredient that we were talking about in the stump and vine killer that's in the poison ivy killer and is in this um, weed be gone, chickweed clover oxalis killer for, for lawns. So this is again targeted towards broadleaf weeds, so it helps to kill them, but it does not injure your grass. Right. So a lot of times in a lawn environment, we can still get selective control where I'm targeting this one weed without damaging my grass. The problem comes in is if I'm in a landscape or a flower bed. And let's say I've just got a, a perennial garden and I've got, you know, the, the perennial geraniums and I've got ground ivy and it's all kind of intertwined in there. I cannot get selective control. I, I the same thing that kills the ground ivy is going to kill my flowers, right? So in that situation, we're pretty much back to hand pulling, right? And this is the part where the weed control gets really dicey and where you have to talk to us up before you start spraying anything in your lawn or garden because we're trying to target and kill one plant without killing the other. So again, and there's a lot of other choices, but I wanted to show you how like this one active ingredient can be Put together many different forms this is what they call hose end sprayer so i can put it in my hose spray it out over like even five thousand square foot air, area of grass and kill the weeds but it doesn't harm the grass if you're in a landscape bed that becomes a different story not for use in a landscape bed only for lawns um, a flip side of that is let's say i have grass that i want to get rid of this could be things like Bermuda grass or crabgrass. Um, and we can, again, there are selective weed killers. There's something like, I'm going to show this. It's called grass be gone. Totally different chemistry. This kills grass, but not broadleaf plants, right? So if I have these weeds like, you know, Bermuda grass, crabgrass, and it's growing in a flower bed and a landscape bed, I can use this to kill those weedy grasses without harming my landscape plants. But if I was to use this in my lawn, it's going to leave dead spots there in there. So again, this one, I talk a lot about selective weed control where we're targeting a specific plant that's in there. And this is where it get, comes to play in a um, very much so in our, in our landscape beds. So Bermuda grass, crabgrass, they look very similar. They're both grasses, same family. Uh, you'll notice a little bit here, this Bermuda grass develops a very strong runner. These um, stolons on there and underground, it's doing rhizomes. 
Uh, oftentimes it's called wire grass because this has a very aggressive spreading habit. Um, the crabgrass does the same thing to an extent, but these are more what we refer to as tillers. They spread out, but they don't keep going and going and going. They kind of reach a, a point. The other that's really significant on here is Bermuda grass is a perennial. Each year it goes dormant. It doesn't die, it goes dormant, but it comes back to life. So it becomes a more aggressive, more hard to control weed that's in there. Crabgrass is an annual grass. Each year it gets killed, but it produces a prolific amount of seeds. And then those seeds germinate, live to come back and haunt us another day. So my little chart I'm talking about here is with an annual weed like crabgrass, in the winter it gets killed, it produces a thousand seeds for each plant. The next spring, that seed starts coming back. So these annuals um, are usually a little bit easier to manage. And we also have the option where we can do a weed preventer. Everything we've been talking about now, you know, has been a, a post-emergent. We've been talking about killing weeds that are actively growing. And this is a good time of year to be doing that, by the way, on almost on everything that we've talked about. Um, what I can do with an annual weed, I have an option where I can apply a weed preventer right here. I can put a product down that will stop or kill that seedling before it ever reaches that next stage of development. And that's always a preferred treatment that is they're, they're effective, they're easy, uh, and we can put that down. And essentially as we're showing, it creates this chemical barrier at the surface of the soil and so if you have existing plants, let's say I've got, you know, landscape with hollies and azaleas and, you know, the rye beer or anything like that, I can put this down uh, and the chemical barriers up here, the roots are down here, so they don't really come in contact with each other. So this is a soil treatment usually applied as a, as a preventative, you know, in a granular formulation. And that barrier that's on there is going to last, it might last 30 days, it might last 120 days, it might last 90 days. That depends very much on the product, so we have to reapply it. Uh, so with summer annuals, and that could include plants like this one, the spotted spurge, this one, purslane, these are annuals, they're going crazy right now, they're big, they're flowering. Um, they'll produce their seeds, but then the winter kills them. And if I choose to, I can put down something to prevent that from coming back next spring. Uh, these are what I call winter annuals. You don't see these growing in your garden right now. Plants like bittercress, chickweed, dead nettle, they will show themselves up next spring, right? So they grow during the cool temperatures. Those seeds start to germinate um, in the fall, usually like a September, October, November time period, depending a little bit on the weather. And then they pop up miraculously next spring. So if I have a history with this type of weed, then I can go in and do some preventive treatments now this time of year. So I know I put a ton of confusing information out there. Um, so let's just stop there and take whatever questions you have. All righty. Well, I know we've got a lot of specific weeds to get to. So I think I'll start by saying um, if we, oh no, what if we have all of these? I'm, that question just came in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay. So we have a lot of individual weeds. So I want to go ahead and put the word out. If you need a specific weed address and we don't get to it, please feel free to send us an email or call the plant clinic. We'd be happy to help you with any specific issue that you're dealing with there. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to add to that. It, it really is confusing. There's no way to make yeah. it simple. Um, so that's why I do encourage you to contact the clinic because we're going to have a bunch of questions where I'm gonna, we need to identify what's weed so I know what's life cycle is, what you're growing in that area so we don't hit the off-target organisms then give you different options. So we, it takes a little time to figure this out. But um, but go ahead, let's let's talk about um, some of the weed questions right. that are coming in. Um, okay, yeah, so the first question's about Japanese knotweed. Um, Brittany's on her second year of dealing with it. She's tried solarization, but it didn't work. 
So um, solarization, we're talking about literally just trying to cook the plants. This is where you put a plastic barrier over the soil and the heat of the plant, of the heat that builds up, literally has to get hot enough to cook the plant, to kill it. Uh, I personally, let me say, I have not tried that. I don't have any firsthand experience with it, but I was at visiting an organic farm not too long ago that's using that. And they, they put their uh, plastic down for six months uh, and still it relies a lot on getting to high enough temperatures. Something like Japanese knotweed that has a very heavy kind of aggressive uh, root system. I, I, I think you're either going to have to get, you know, digging, um, which is not an easy task because there's quite a root system that's in there, or start looking at one of these brush killers. Uh, and, and I understand not wanting to do the chemical treatments. Um, I'm not trying to sell that on you, but they, they, they do, science shows that they, they degrade pretty rapidly. The brush be gone, brush killer kind of stuff. Typically, you know, has a half-life in the soil that's measured in in a week or less that's there. But again, if you're going to go organic, I think you can do a combination of things, which is solarization like you are along with hand pulling, solarization, hand pulling back and forth and just being persistent. Okay. Um, how about strawberry plants that are spreading? Of uh, and I'm assuming that we're talking about the wild strawberry. Um, I'm guessing, yes. Right. So there's, there's a lot of different um, herbicides that work pretty well on that. I'm just because of trying to keep stuff simple. I'm saying, and, and there's different companies. I mean, but basically like a chickweed clover oxalis killer. This does have triclopyr in it as one of the ingredients. Um, and it tends to work better on some of these hard control weeds. Now, again, this is for use in a lawn. Um, we can, not in a garden bed. Right. Not because if it's in a garden bed, this would also kill your flowers. So you're probably going to have to be dealing with hand pulling if it's in a garden bed. Some people, um, and this is just as tedious. See, this has a little paintbrush. Comes with, so it's the brush killer, but you could theoretically go around and paint it just onto the strawberries so that you don't accidentally contact your surrounding flowers. But I don't know if that's more or less work than pulling by hand. Hand pulling, yeah. Um, okay, how about, this is in a garden bed and this is thistle. Would that be something that you would have to hand pull? Same situation? That is just, it's, I, I think I left this out, my little introduction here, my very first sentence uh, that I forgot to read to you, because uh, this was admitting defeat before you start. I wrote in here, it's note to myself, that I think I forgot to read to you. So for starters, let's acknowledge that we are facing a tough adversary in many situations. There are no good, easy solutions, but we will talk through the various options and do the best we can. That um, so many of these things, I don't have really good or easy yeah. solutions to it. Thistle is one of them. They, they are one of the worst of it. So this becomes what I call, you throw everything you've got at it. You you can try to hit it chemically with some like these um, brush killers. Um, that's not gonna kill it out completely. You're also trying to do some digging, you know, getting the rhizomes out of the ground. You'll never get complete control on that. And it becomes what I call kind of a battle of attrition where you just keep going at it, you keep going at it, you put everything you've got at it and see who wears out first. Gotcha. All right, here's a question about a gravel driveway. So we're dealing with some hardscaping now. Um, Anna's dealing with oxalis and euphorbia growing in her gravel driveway and she's found no effective means other than hand pulling for days. Is there any better solution for her? Um, I'm glad you brought that up. That was um, something else I forgot in my little outline. I wanted to talk about non-selective controls because these weed killers, I'm talking about the lawn and garden, we're trying to target specific plants that are in there. If I'm in a driveway or weeds in the crack of a sidewalk or something, and I'm not worried about collateral damage to plants, um, I'm still going to say, the most effective one out there, and everybody's probably familiar with it, is Roundup. 
Um, this is a non-selective weed killer, um, and it comes under different formulations, different names, and so on. Uh, but this basically, with whatever you spray it on, it kills it. So if I spray it on, that's how bird, my mom accidentally killed killed the palm tree. Yeah. Like so 15 years ago. <laughs> but again, what it's intended for again is like in a driveway, sidewalk kind of environment yeah. that's out there. So it is absorbed through the leaf tissue. It goes down into the roots and does kill the plants top and bottom. Of uh, it's not a permanent solution because eventually there's seeds, there might still be a, a little tuber that's in the ground. It may come back and you may have to do repeat treatment. But Roundup is probably going to be your most effective one. I did want to talk briefly about some of these um, alternatives because sort of non-chemical terms or non-conventional type things. So like 30% vinegar um, is getting a lot of attention out there for use as a non-selective weed killer. So things like your driveway that's in there. The difference is, and I think we really have to just understand what we're dealing with, this kills the top of the plant. And it, it's the same thing, you know, there's different products that are out there. I'll just say they use soaps, salts, you know, vinegar, which is strong acid, and it kills the plant and it kills it qu quickly. But if it's a got an established root system, it did not get into the root system and it will come back. I also want to say if you're pursuing any of these kind of home remedies uh, type of thing, be aware of all the precautions. This, this product here is actually the most, the harshest, most toxic one that we sell in our entire store. And you're saying, how could that be? Um, well, if you look on here, it says poison. Uh, these signal words, it goes caution, warning, danger, poison. Poison being the highest um, risk that goes on there. Because like the vinegar that you might be using in your kitchen might be like, you know, three to six percent this is highly concentrated for for like horticulture use at 30 percent so again just because it's a natural product does not in any way shape or form mean to imply it's safe but um i i want to touch on that because a lot of people are going that route and i'm not trying to stop you or discourage you but just understand that the plants may come back and it may require repeat treatments or repeat applications well and that leads to another question that we have um actually okay let me ask this other one first while we're still on it will roundup damage bricks does that damage the hardscaping no okay. no um vinegar can but i'm gonna say it's it's kind of qualified and that's that's if with a lot of repeated use okay gotcha. Strong form. um okay so the question that I was going to ask is um, how can you talk a little bit about how using these chemicals affects the insects? Is there anything to look out for in particular? Um, what are your recommendations if people want to be careful about insects? Just what are your thoughts on that? So they're, they're not they're not directly harmful to insects. Now, now some would say by using them it changes the ecology and and we're stepping a little stray from home gardens but i'm just gonna say like in commercial production agriculture there's a lot of um stuff you know about like roundup ready corn soybean cotton and so on um because in a more traditional kind of system you might have things like milkweed and goldenrod and weeds growing amongst the crop and those provided uh, resources for insects. Um, if we kill those plants off, then we eliminate the resource for the insects. So they absolutely have an ecological uh, impact, but it's not like it's a direct toxicity to them. So I think, again, it, all this is done with judgment, discretion, and why I keep saying, you know, where hand pulling, hand weeding fits into your program, that's where I want to begin. But we get overwhelmed. We get to where it's just too much. It's more than we can keep up with. And then we may end up doing the occasional uh, pesticide treatment. Gotcha. Okay. Um, 
All right, we're over time, but we have a ton more questions. Would you be okay to go for a few more minutes? Yes, because I know I've been kind of chatty here today, but I, I try and fit too much stuff in. No problem. I am going to warn you all. We are not, I'm sorry, There's. I'm not seeing that we're going to be able to get to all of these questions, but I'm going to try. Sorry, I'm looking at the questions, so I'm not looking at the camera. Um, we're not going to be able to get to all of these, but so I'm going to try and cover the ones that are the most broadly applicable. And if you have questions that don't get answered about your specific weeds that you're dealing with, like I said, please feel free to call the plant clinic or send us an email. So just going to go ahead and warn you guys, we'll keep going and I'm going to try and hit the broadest topics um, to hopefully, hopefully help you guys out. Um, alrighty. So can we talk about already existing weeds in the lawn? So uh, this person is asking specifically about uh, plants that they look like they're grass. <laughs> they say they think foxtail is one that they have, but if you've got weeds in the lawn now that you need to get rid of, what products should you be using? Yeah, and and let me say in two weeks, I'm gonna talk about the fall lawn care, but- um, All the lawn I, care, yes. You asked about, because what happens, most of these weed control products there's going to be a waiting time before you can do your seeding. So let's say I was to go out and spray my lawn today, there might be a two, three, four week or longer waiting time before I can do my seeding. So that is something that I, I like to talk about. I did not bring it up here with me, but uh, things like foxtail, crabgrass, uh, these are annual grasses uh, that do get killed off in the winter time. So one option is to say, hey, the weeds kind of got away from me. I'm gonna ignore it today. The temperature, the freezing weather will kill them and I will get on a preventative program next year. That's totally valid, legit way to do it. Your other choice, and we, we'd have to talk to you in more detail in the store, there are selective killers that will kill like crabgrass and foxtail um, that you could spray that would kill the weeds. And I think those have about a four week, three to four week waiting time before you can do your seeding. But you could do that because now it's kind of late August. I could do my spraying, kill the weeds, wait my four weeks and come back and do my seeding in late September. Uh, but basically it's going to say crabgrass killer in some way, shape, or form on the on the label. Um, but we always like to confirm that, to bring us samples or, and pictures and make sure we have the weed identified correctly and you understand the precautions that go in there. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about vegetable beds. We've had a question come in on that. Um, this person has a raised bed, and of course, vegetables don't always cover the whole ground, so there's no way to you know, like cover the ground enough to keep the weeds from coming up. Um, is there anything that they can use to prevent the weeds if they can't get the plantings dense enough? Or is that a handful situation or just kind of live with it? What What would you recommend? What, um, what, what worked best for me uh, is I'm a big fan of using some newspaper and straw on top of it or a paper mulch. Uh, we don't sell it, but others may have just paper mulch or biodegradable mulches down. But we want to do that um, before the weeds are up and growing. So let's say if I'm planting, you know, tomatoes and peppers and stuff in, in May, I would be doing my planting and then putting down a paper mulch. And then you could put an additional more attractive mulch on top of it. You'll never get 100%, but that blocks, I mean, literally like 85, 90%, and then the hand pulling is manageable. So that is certainly an option, depending on your style of gardening too. If we do less disruption of the garden, meaning that I'm doing more of what I'll call a no-till practice, of less disturbance of the soil, then that also helps to diminish amount of weeds that we come up. But there are no herbicides or weed killers that I'm going to do in a vegetable garden. This can be fully dependent on mechanical and cultural kind of practices. Uh, that's a bias, you know, I'm just thinking because things like the, the preen weed preventer is labeled and approved for use in a vegetable garden is just something I, I couldn't imagine doing. Okay. Um... All righty. Next question. We have a question about the wild violets. I love that. I, we always get questions about the violets. Um, what would you use to get rid of those, by the way? Yeah. 
And again, that's the classic one, whether you choose yeah. to beautiful. Love the violets, beautiful. hate the violets. We always have both. <laughs> uh, so that 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 chickweed clover oxalis killer, the brush killer, kind okay. of discussed so much is a good option. Another one that I will just show to, to kind of introduce it to you, what's sold as nut sedge killer, um, is also giving us some pretty good performance on violets of no really good answers. This is something that, again, is going to take some persistence. There's no one and done. There's nothing like nothing I can spray and say, okay, I'm done with that. It's going to take some persistence because that, again, is just a very resistant, hard to control weed. But either the, that nuts edge killer or one of the chickweed clover killers is going to be your best options. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we have a question from an attendee and I just want to go ahead and address this with everyone here and you might want to add something, David, but um, I know I send out for a lot of you who attend, I send out plant lists or I send them out through the chat. I haven't been doing that as much with these products because I don't, I don't fully understand the complexities of all of them. So I can't send, send these out. But if you have questions about the products and you want to follow up with us after the class to get a list or recommendations, you're welcome to do that. Um, but I also, I can't email out a list to this group because we don't, since we're streaming, I don't have everybody's emails this time. But um, David, I'm sure if people want to call you, you can help them get their product yeah. name. And, and I'm just, that's with pesticides. I'm just want to be really cautious that we you understand what it is, how to use it, all the precautions yeah. well. So what Sally's telling you, I don't even provide her the information and it's not because I'm trying to withhold it. No. <laughs> I'm just, I, I don't like doing pesticide recommendations if I, if I yeah. don't have a good diagnosis in front of me. Uh, and, and like I said, I'm, I, I answer emails all day long. I Definitely. keep up with this and I, and I'd like to have a picture confirmation, that kind of thing. Just, it's really make sure you get the right information or yeah. using everything correctly. Yeah. Thanks, David. Yeah. That's what I, I'll send out plant names all day. I'll look up spellings for you guys and send out notes, but I, I too, I don't like to send out products and product names without having it go through through David or a plant clinic. So, um, all right, uh, we have a question. We have time for a couple more. Um, I want to get to this question going back to the triclopyr and applying it to the porcelain berry. So we've had a few people where the, these are climbing their trees. If you're applying the triclopyr to the porcelain berry that's climbing on a tree, this person has a tulip poplar. Um, is that any danger to the tree? Like how so that that's where I'm saying I want to make sure that we only apply it to the porcelain berry. So, gotcha. so you have to be very uh, careful. This is kind of what I was that's one of the reasons I chose this. It's not like I'm trying to push that's why you made a point to get sort of different brands up here. Uh what I think is cool is for and and for you to understand, I'm gonna pull these back, we're making see them a little better. So these three products all have the same active ingredient. Um, this one, as we're talking about, applied with a paintbrush. So a lot of times, if I have a vine like porcelain berry that's climbing up a tulip popper and I don't want to risk getting that tulip popper, then I would suggest you do this and paint it onto the vine. That way I'm limiting exposure to the popper. If I'm in a situation where like, again, like more like I'm being poison ivy, this could be porcelain berry. If I want to spray it like this in a little trigger spray, I can spray it onto the leaves of the porcelain berry and it gets absorbed. But I have to be careful because I really don't want to get this onto the poplar. Tulip poplars have a relatively, relatively thin bark and it has to be extreme, but it is possible for this to penetrate through the bark and harm the tulip popper. So that's what I'm trying to be really cautious about, that we don't let that happen. This is the same thing which we can spray over lawn areas. So it's really different methods of application to avoid that risk of damage to the tulip popper. Gotcha. So, you can really start to see how all this is very custom to the situation. Right. And that's, again, back to where I say we really just prefer to talk to you in person to make sure that we get the results that we want and don't accidentally harm the tulip popper. All right. Yeah. All right. This is going to be our last question. Um, actually, okay. I have a quick one. Do you still recommend that you use speed zone for anything? I know oh, speed zone is terrific, but that's a, um, 
it's a broadleaf weed killer and gotcha. lawns. And so a lawn broadleaf weed killer. Okay. Great product. I just I I was trying to stick to limited number of products so I don't yeah. get too confused. <laughs> Okay, we had a question about that and I recognize it. Um, all right, our last question. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with this plant, I don't think, but I do want to ask you about this, this particular situation. So um, Roberta says, I would like advice on lesser celadine. It has taken over fairly large areas near my house. Her house is 25 yards from a storm pond. So does any of this change? I know if she, then she's near a body of water. Um, I guess, I don't know if, it's, I guess it's, I'm not sure if storm pond, I'm not sure if that would be like a retention pond or something. Somehow, sometimes we have different words for things down here in Florida, but. If, if, you're would, 20, if you're 25 feet away, that's, that's more than enough buffer. I would use again, one of these products I talked about the tricycle. Okay. Now, lesser celandine is really, really hard to control. I don't want to tell you you're going to spray it and that problem's fixed. Um, it's going to take some persistence. And even then, because it's got the waxy leaf that doesn't get in, it's got the tuber that's in the ground. Um, hand digging, I'll put it out there, but if it gets going and it's a wide area, it might not be possible. But I've had some people have large areas and they are going out with something like this or the brush killer, treating these areas, trying to be careful to limit collateral damage to any native vegetation that might be around it. Also, keep an eye on your weather forecast so that um, you do this on a dry day. But, but as long as you're not spraying it into the waterway, you're not, and you're, you're leaving yourself a little bit of a buffer, I, I can't imagine there's much risk of that actually getting in there. Gotcha. Okay. Um, all right. It's 3.01, everybody. So we are going to have to call it for the day. Uh, I know we have a lot more questions. I will say this again and again, <laughs> please feel free to contact us if you need any help. Um, as David had been saying, these are very, every situation is different for every customer and they're happy to provide you all with custom information on your plants that you're dealing with. Um, this class is recorded. You can look for it on YouTube tomorrow if you want to revisit it. Uh, and David, do you want to close with any final information for, uh -huh. for everyone? Kind of the same thing I always do because a lot of this depends on getting good, accurate identification of the weed to start with. So we love to, you know, if you take a picture of your cell phone, that's good. But if you can bring a sample and a photograph, that's even better. You know, bring it into the plant clinics. We're all here to help you and getting a good idea on the weeds, a good starting point. Otherwise, you know, send, send your picture and your questions to Sal. It'll get to me and I'll get back to you. Definitely. All right. Well, David, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great afternoon and please send us those questions. I will forward them to David if you email them to me. Uh, so you can rest, rest assured you will hear from an expert <laughs> and not from the uh, events manager. All right. I will talk to you all later, David. Thank you so much. Chat with you later. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye.